Hello, this is Zach Goldstein, CEO of Thanks. I'm here with Mike Speck, CEO of Asian Box, and we're excited for you all to join us today on our webinar, The Outsized Importance of Customer Data and Retention in a Delivery-Driven World. And so, Mike, I'll let you introduce yourself, uh, and I'll do the same, and maybe we'll get going in uh, about 30 seconds uh, after people uh, get on board and, and keep logging in. There seems to be a good number of attendees still joining at the, at the moment. Great. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been part of Asian Box since early August. Uh, Asian Box is based in Palo Alto. We have 11 locations in Northern California and Southern California, specialize in uh, fresh, ready, ready to order uh, Vietnamese style street food. Uh, pr pretty proud of what we're doing. Uh, emerging brand, ready to break out nationwide. Uh, and uh, prior to that, I spent three years with a group called the Hello Guys out of New York City, where we went from zero locations on the franchise side to almost 100 uh, and uh, uh, experienced in uh, national and international growth. So it's a pleasure to be here. Pretty amazing. Uh, a great story. And and, uh, and now you're doing it again with yeah. a new, new exciting brand in Asian Box. Uh, and so it uh, looks like we've got people trickling in, um, but we're going to get going. We have some materials to share, and then Mike and I are just going to have a have a discussion about some of the challenges uh, of third-party delivery, um, opportunities and challenges, I should say, um, of third-party delivery. Um, and so we'll start with just some some overview materials uh, and then dive into to q and A. It's It's clear to everyone that the third-party delivery market is becoming quite large. Uh, restaurant delivery is going in 2017 from about eight to nine billion dollars uh, in third-party food delivery uh, to 16 billion in the next five years. We have heard that there is uh, some technical difficulty with the screen, so we're going to refresh it, and now we're good to go. Um, so the third, part, third party food delivery market, uh, as I just mentioned, eight to nine billion dollars in 2017, uh, going to 16 in 2022. This is a massive leap and it's affecting restaurants across the country um, who see this as a, as a really large revenue opportunity, but also one that's fundamentally disrupting your business. 10% of food sold through restaurants is now through food delivery services. That number ranges anywhere from 2 to 30%, depending on the restaurant. Uh, and that's growing rapidly. And in fact, by 2021, uh, some estimates, this source, McKinsey, believes that 20% of food through restaurants uh, will be sold through delivery services. It's a fundamental change, uh, and it increases the importance of knowing your customers and building deeper relationships in order to get them to come back. So we know this to be true because third-party delivery companies are everywhere. You see the logos here. You see the news about uh, the importance of, of these massively growing delivery platforms. Uh, and you see the impact that delivery is having on brands. Delivery-driven Domino's and Papa John stocks outperform Take and Bake Papa Murphy's by a massive, massive gap, 450%. And we know that third-party delivery is a driver for a lot of businesses, but in-house delivery, such as for Panera, uh, is actually driving, uh, in this case, digital sales of $2 billion reported uh, as of last month. And so the opportunity is clear, but the risks are real as well. Panera CEO Blaine Hurst said, we do make money with delivery, but a lot of the restaurants that are using third parties, they don't make much. What it is, they don't believe they have a choice. And reflecting on that with a CEO of a smaller brand, Michelle from Mulberry and Vine based in New York City, we know for a fact that as delivery increases, our profitability decreases. I think we are losing money on delivery orders or best case, breaking even. So these are some of the challenges that we know businesses are facing. And when you look at the watchouts in the industry, there are, there are roughly five. Uh, and this is what Mike and I are going to talk about today. Uh, huge fees that make a pretty substantial impact on margins. Third-party delivery providers charge upwards of 40%. Hopefully, the rates that, that you are paying are lower than that. Uh, but still, 
it's unlikely that you find anyone paying less than 10% uh, and often 20, 30 is, is in the range. No booze. For businesses that sell alcohol on premise, uh, you know the profitability impact of alcohol and obviously not being able to deliver that uh, lowers your margins overall. And so the first two are an impact on lower margins. The next three are an impact on fewer repeat purchases. Quality control. You do not have control over delivery times and so the conditions of what your customer receives are out of your hands. And the reality is the customer uh, views the food coming from your brand. They fault the restaurant. They don't fault the delivery service. Competition. One of the big challenges is that even if someone has a great delivery experience, when they log on to a delivery app for the next, next time they want to order from you, they are overwhelmed with a bunch of other options. This is the nature of a marketplace. And so the challenge here, of course, is that even if you do an exceptional job, you're not guaranteed that person's repeat purchase. And of course, you don't have any ability to follow up with these people. You don't have their email address. You don't have their phone number. You don't have loyalty. And so the challenge of no marketing uh, tools is, is a fundamental uh, risk. And so, We'll talk about a couple others, but uh, Mike, let's let's go through these in order um, as you think about both the margin piece and the fewer repeat visit piece, right? These are challenges you've seen, both at Halal Guys that was doing a pretty sizable volume, uh, but certainly at Asian Box as well, also doing a sizable volume. T tell us about, first of all, the scale of delivery operations you've overseen uh, at either of those brands, uh, and then some of these challenges that you've faced. Yeah, it's interesting is we uh, we right now at Asian Box will do everything from single box orders, which would be an entree, to uh, several hundred. And those are all coming through the services in the same format. Uh, we, we, we like to think that large orders will give us a heads up notice, but we'll be taking orders of that size as early as the morning. Uh, so, so it makes my uh, individual unit operators' uh, lives very challenging, but they take the approach. There's no sale will turn down. Uh, and and it's, a, it's on our side to know that we have priced accordingly to make sure that we are profitable. Uh, I, I personally look at the fee as a good thing. The more I pay in fees, the more I should be paying or seeing in sales. We just have to make sure that we're um, coordinating our labor, our ordering, and our preparation to go along with it. Uh, but it, it's a huge part of our business, upwards of 30% in some of our locations. Yeah. So it's here to stay. Right. It's, it's certainly a new way of doing business. Talk about the trade-offs. Um, and ultimately the decision you made on how to price your food on delivery services. Yeah, we, you know, I, I would tell you honestly is when I, when I first took over, we were not pricing to account for the commissions. Uh, and, and we did take, uh, we did take some price over time. And uh, we look at it as the right thing to do because it's fair. Uh, we've also found that the uh, convenience factor from the consumer 100% outweighs the uh, small expense that they pay. And people just simply got used to delivery fees. So we, we just want to be competitive. What, what were the risks you were worried about in doing that? Yeah, I, I always risk. I, I always worry about the risk is every time there's a price increase, is there a transaction count decrease? And uh, we're truly watching that. So so we're doing everything we can to um, head it off the past tax point about once it leaves our store, uh, we'll, it's, it's hands off. So we're doing everything we can from a packaging perspective to make sure it gets there better than anybody else's. It travels well, uh, leaky bags, et cetera, et cetera. Have you seen any um, uh, of these, you know, kind of quality control issues and how have you trained your staff to respond to them? Because it's, it's, it's an if, yeah. not a, it's a win, not yeah. an if. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and what do you do in that case to, yeah. to be well prepared? Yeah, I, I, I'll share with everybody because the one thing I believe in the uh, restaurant industry is we're all in this together, is uh, we try and do our best to take care of the drivers. Uh, we will truly feed drivers when we can, give them stuff because we know they're working. But, uh, you know, I, I like to think our little secret, which is no longer a secret, is the drivers will respect us and we'll respect them, just like if they were one of our employees. Right. And we know they have a tough life. I mean, they're, they're on their feet and they're driving, and especially us, we have urban locations, right. which make parking quite a challenge, and, uh, but they're trying to earn a buck, so we just want to take care of them. So I think that's, that's a really keen insight because uh, I've walked into some restaurants and, and uh, you know, the drivers are waiting outside uh, in the cold and told not to walk in and 
Uh, and that makes logical sense operationally. You don't want to jam up your operation. And yet the impact is those drivers are often, in many ways, your repeat customer and the thing standing between you and your customer. Yeah, so true. And so you recognizing that those people matter to you actually is 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 part of making delivery work in your system. Yeah, I, I've always uh, tried to position the operation with the concept of building the brand from the inside out. Uh, so if you take care of employees, they take care of the customers. Uh, the services are employees of ours indirectly. Right. And it, it's so important that they're loyal to us. Right. Just like we want to be to them. So when you think about this challenge, the, the last two buckets here of uh, maybe you've delivered a great experience, uh, but when that person logs on to a third-party delivery app, they're getting wooed by a bunch yeah. of other restaurants. The competition is fiercer in an app than it is walking down the street. Uh, and the lack of information you get from those partners in terms of how to actually know who these customers are. are Do you currently have any ways to get around that, or that's just kind of a pill you have to swallow? Yeah, right now it's a pill we have to swallow. Uh, the, the approach I've taken with the services and every other vendor is they're partners of ours. And there's two ways to look at it. One is it's a service is an expense. The other is it's a benefit. And I, I've tried to take personal time to get to know each of our third-party delivery services. And what I know ultimately is I will partner predominantly with the vendor or the service that most looks like us and acts like us. And out of that, I believe we will both win together. But we got to build a relationship. Right. And... Uh, you know, a lot of good things happen when you build a relationship. Right. And out of that, we get more information on how we're going to do this. But right now, I'm, it's a sale is all we have. And have you gained uh, uh, any information about uh, whether these customers are true delivery-only customers, whether they're in-store and delivery customers? Is there an overlap or it's just kind of unknown right now? Yeah, it's, it's totally unknown for us. Uh, we'll have the frequent people that will, well, the seldom people that will come in and tell us, you know, I've been busy at work, but on the weekends I come by. Right. But I'd love to know more. Right. You know, we're doing everything to make it right going out the door. Right. We just don't know what happens after that. Right. And I, I don't like that. Right. So, so some interesting other challenges, and we'll dive into more Q&A with Mike, but I wanted to pause and kind of get his thoughts here. But some interesting other challenges that we've seen. Uh, you know, there's this, which is, uh, are people appropriating your brand? <laughs> this is one that struck me by surprise as I was flipping through the app. Um, and it's halal guys uh, showed up in uh, Uber Eats as halal boys. Well, this is problematic. And I know this resulted in some legal wrangling uh, in a past life for you, Mike. Uh, but this is a concern. Uh, and the other is the presence of restaurants that have a completely different structure and margin. And these are so-called ghost restaurants uh, that are serving food, popping up, but they are not paying real estate costs. Uh, this is a competitive advantage in a delivery-based world, which means you as a restaurant running a brick-and-mortar business need to use the advantage you have. You have a storefront. You have customers that walk in. Uh, and some of what we're going to talk about today is the importance of building an owned audience of customers that, that you really have control over. And so Mike and I gave this presentation at NRA. Um, uh, in May. Uh, since then, Mike jumped over and took over Asian Box and is, is really a very promising concept. And so we'll dive in to some, some of that experience. Um, uh, and this is the two of us, uh, if you were wondering uh, who, who we are. <laughs> uh, and so let's talk more in detail. Um, I, mean, I think you shared the number briefly, Mike, but what kind of numbers can you share about the increase in delivery for Asian Box? Um, and anecdotally, what are you seeing and hearing across the industry more broadly? Yeah, the, the, the one thing that's a given on our side is it's here to stay. I said that earlier. Two is it's increasing. It's clearly increasing. Uh, I, I like to own that, that everybody else is busy like we are, and convenience outweighs cost. Uh, and, and it's simply the right time and the right place. I also like to think that our, our product travels very well. So it's very conducive to the idea. Uh, and, and then the other part for us, we believe, is that our in-store experience has created the trust in the delivery business that when people see our name, they can relate to what the product's going to be and how it's going to get there. Uh, and, and, you know, we just want to continue on the path. And we, we have three prongs in our business. One, obviously, is in-store transactions. The second is catering. And then the third, which we all know is growing exponentially, is uh, delivery services. And, and clearly, we know a lot about the first two categories because we know who they are. Uh, the third's a, uh, a big question for me. Right. I, I, I could just watch the transactions, but... I'd like to know more there. Right. 
Yeah, and, and when you think about the challenge, I think one of the questions we hear often is this question of multi-sourcing versus single sourcing. Do you put yourself on Uber and DoorDash and, uh, and Caviar and all of these services, uh, and obviously they're regionally dependent, um, or do you try to pick a partner and, and stick with it? And I think there is not necessarily a right answer, but how have you thought about yeah, it? Yeah, well, there's two things. One is, you know, the reality that we all face called operational challenges is anytime you go to multiple vendors, you have multiple tablets, and you could go into any business right now, and you'll just see what we call tablet hell. Yeah. They're taking up counter space. <laughs> they're a distraction for the in-store business because, uh, you know, an order comes in and makes noise, and the employee has to make that tough decision between do I acknowledge the order and confirm it, or do I take care of the people in the store? Uh, it's a lose-lose on both sides. So, so our look has got to be that we're going to trim it down to one or two preferred, uh, even possibly exclusive. Ones that work with us, give us better placement, uh, understand our growth, and it's very measurable. Yep. Because, uh, you know, sometimes uh, diluting doesn't always help. And, and let's, let's ask this question for, for any of our friends from the third-party delivery services who may listen to this webinar. Uh, the sharing of information about your top delivery customers such that you can build deeper, longer-term relationships with them. Would that be a major factor in the decision to go exclusive or on who to work with? Oh, absolutely. You know, to the point that they feel connected with us uh, is a good thing for everybody. Plus, you know, I like to say that uh, a, uh, a loyal customer is a trained customer, which makes the ordering process on both ends much easier. Right. And, uh, you know, it, it leads to frequency. Right. Because the trust just grows. Right. But we need to build the trust. We have, have to know who they are. That's, that, that, that is a really important. To build the trust, we have to know who they are. And I think the anonymity is one of the challenges we hear restaurants come across. Uh, businesses that have built fairly robust customer retention or loyalty programs that then can't extend those to their delivery customers, uh, they get a lot of pushback from delivery customers. I spend hundreds of dollars with you and I'm not getting rewarded on it. Uh, and the danger is they have nothing that they can do. The restaurants have nothing they can do to solve that. And more importantly, if that hundreds of dollar customer disappeared tomorrow, you'd have no clue. Yeah, I, I had a, I call it an epiphany because I like to use that word sometimes. But I, I was in one of the one of our locations that are busy lunch and the bags are just going out the door and I'm looking at the food and everything is right. And I looked to one, you know, a couple of my folks and I just said, all we're doing right now is delivering what they expect. We're not doing anything to be different because we can't. And, you know, my, my team looked at me like I was nuts and I said, they order food, we're delivering food. They're ordering what we what they want, we're doing what they want. We're doing zero above and beyond. And and right now I'm handcuffed. And it's hard because if you don't know who they are, right. it's pretty darn hard to give them a personalized experience. Yeah, yeah. I said, I, I just want to be able to say thank you somehow right. and let them say thank you for saying thank you. Great. That's exactly right. And we actually find um, that just the act of recognition, whether that's in asking for feedback or responding to feedback uh, or rewarding them for their loyalty, uh, does drive incremental frequency. People want to be recognized. Uh, and the challenge, of course, is if you don't know who they are, it's pretty hard to recognize yeah, them. Yeah. Okay, so as we as we look into more um, from a quality control standpoint, um, as you as you amp up third party delivery, what are some of these important things that you put in place operationally to ensure that, as to the best of your ability, what lands in front of a customer is the thing you want to land in front of a customer? Yeah, you know, it's it's a couple of things are what so many people have done back um, to kind of work backwards is how do you stage it within the business? to make it so, I like to say, his performance is not punishing. Right. We ask our employees to do something and we punish them because they don't have the space, the tools, the ability to create to-go orders. So we have special pickup areas, we have special shelving, so it's convenient for the drivers and the customers to walk in, and it's also convenient for the, uh, you know, for, for the employees. Uh, we, we found the use of an aggregator for the deliveries has been helpful as well to take away some of the mental gymnastics that has to occur every time the uh, tablet goes. Right. Uh, and, and all those pieces just lead to easier execution. Right. Uh, packaging, of course, is, is most important. Uh, you know, I, I, I like to thank our friends in the pizza business for uh, delivering pizzas, but I've never gotten a hot pizza in my life. So <laughs> for us to deliver hot food is a benefit. But good grief, you guys have just uh, done phenomenal with it. Right. Uh, so our whole goal is to deliver hot, fresh food. Right. So as you think about, you know, Asian Box is a growth concept. There are going to be uh, many more Asian Boxes uh, sprouting up. Uh, is there any change in how you would think about designing those restaurants in a world that is 
uh, and fast growing. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I have conversations going on right now with people um, on the East Coast in Texas, potential groups that um, want to develop with us. And we've added a, a called a fourth pillar in the real estate. We, we had always worked under three pieces, which is uh, density, accessibility, and aesthetics for the site. We've added a fourth part of the aesthetics, which is uh, delivery service pickup. Because again, we, we just know it's here. Right. Uh, we, we don't necessarily need a big dining room because of this, uh, but we need to make it easy again for the drivers to simply get in and get out. Uh, you know, I just watched, we have an urban location in downtown San Francisco, and you watch how creative these people could be with their cars and the scooters and uh, you know, we, we just, again, have to treat them like they're our guests. Right. Right. Um, okay. Final question, and, and then uh, we'll open it up to, to Q&A uh, after I give a quick walkthrough of a couple more materials. Um, uh, in terms of retention of customers and repeat frequency, we've talked about this. What, what are the, the – the, the answer is you don't get any information today. Right. What are the basic things that would change that fundamentally for you? Um, in terms of data that you could capture from these customers that that actually is the, the information you want from these third-party delivery services. Yeah, you know, you, there's the key thing that I want to know is where are people coming from. Right. Uh, because, again, that helps us with our outreach and it helps us with site selection. Uh, we all know there's plenty of articles written about. Uh, this data will help people identify their nice site because they can see where they're coming from. Uh, the Cloud Kitchen story is the same way. Uh, I just believe that if we could connect with people versus just being a meal off of a service, uh, we win. Yep. And and I need to know who they are to some level. So I could say, you know, the simple things again, thank you. I like yep. to say that. You know, I, I, I found that people love the trinkets. Uh, they love the little things that are unique to that brand. Right. You may not wear them, but if they're sitting on the counter in the kitchen, I, I want to give that stuff away. So we actually do find this with, with loyalty programs that we run that you can always give a discount or a free item. Some of the stuff that's most compelling is actually you know, to your loyal guests, branded apparel. People actually like like your brand so much that they spend a lot of their money on food coming to it. Of course, they're going to wear your yeah. your logo yeah. elsewhere. They're proud of it. Yeah. They feel part of the part of the family. Uh, and so, it's these creative ways to to build personal relationships, as you talk about, that are so powerful. Uh, and in the status quo today, with delivery, unfortunately, missing. I'll walk through a couple things that we found at Thanks, and then we can open it up to Q&A. There's a couple good ones in here. You know, what Thanks is is a customer engagement tool. We think of that as CRM, marketing automation, customer experience, and loyalty. Uh, all of that underpinned around measurable ROI. And so what that means and why that matters is because 62% of revenue comes from the top 25% of customers across the restaurant industry. And it's the chance of selling to a new prospect is about 5 to 20%. The chance of selling to an existing customer is 60 to 70%. We find uh, across the industry that it's about seven times more cost effective to acquire an incremental visit from an existing customer. And so Thanks combines elements that previously were a variety of point solutions, insights into your customers, customer loyalty, targeted marketing campaigns across channels, feedback, and detailed revenue reporting. And I'm going to touch on this very briefly, and then we'll get to Q&A. But communication across channel, segmented emails, real-time SMS, app-based push notifications, web and social, all made effortless by tying together the transaction no matter where that purchase happens. Today, in-store phone, online, all tied together through our partnerships with credit card networks and online ordering providers. Delivery coming soon. Some exciting news in Q1 uh, about our ability to actually ingest delivery transaction data into this CRM that we're building. Multi-channel communication. And what it ends up looking like are detailed profiles of who are my customers. Truly, personally understand VIPs. Capture feedback after they make a purchase in a private channel so that you can engage with them directly and understand the intent and what went well and what went wrong. Build loyalty programs that are more than hooking people on regular discounts. Status and tiers and personalization, surprises and delights, things that sophisticated brands have been using for a long time uh, but haven't been available to the average mid-sized restaurant. 
targeted campaigns to send a message to all of your known customers, email subscribers, loyalty members, et cetera, or to send segmented messages to your lost customers or the customers who don't visit you on the weekend, uh, the customers who perhaps are your VIPs or who used to be your VIPs. And then finally, what's been missing from marketing in the restaurant industry for a long time? Detailed revenue reporting. How did that campaign work? Did it drive incremental revenue? What is the actual impact of all of my marketing in terms of revenue on the business? And so these are the, the hallmark elements of what is thanks. Uh, and the, the benefit there is that you have an owned audience of customers that you can interact with directly. And so now that we've gone that overview, I'm going to ask you a couple questions from the audience, Mike. We have about five minutes left. Um, one is around taking price on delivery orders. Uh, did you take price on in-restaurant sales as well? Uh, we, we did. We had a, a structured 120-day uh, menu price evolution, uh, timed in some cases with minimum wage increases. Again, we're, we're in California where, you know, you're here in parts of the world, the fight for 15. Uh, we're way beyond the fight for 15. So, so we're, we're just trying to, in one case, get to parity and others. We are acknowledging the market conditions have changed for us. Great. Uh, and that is that is certainly a challenge that is magnified here in California. Yes, yeah. um, which services or service do you use to aggregate these third-party delivery, and and what have been your observations across using those tools? Uh, yeah, we, we utilize a service called OrderMark, uh, which uh, is doing a very big push. They're good people. Mm -hmm. uh, the system works. It really does. Uh, and what I would tell you is if you have a five-volume location and you turn it on, just be prepared because it does everything they say it will. And uh, what I found is operators are used to monitoring or metering the speed at which they ring up orders. Once you turn on the service, they go directly to the uh, printer in the kitchen. Right. Which is a good thing. Uh, Speeds up things yeah. operationally, yeah. but does mean that you can process a lot more volume, and, it, and that does create new challenges. It moves a potential bottleneck from one place to another. So it's just, a, you know, operator, operator, be prepared. Right. Uh, right. There's so a couple questions in here. Um, some people that have said they love the brands that you've worked with, Asian Box, Halal Guys, so that is exciting. Uh, and yes, the session is being recorded. Uh, another question uh, from Scott. What are the thoughts on using labels for the delivery items? I'm assuming it means your branding yep. um, across delivery items. Yeah, yeah you know what? Um, labeling of who gets what or by the product uh, is incredibly important. We do that. Uh, truly, everything goes out of the kitchen makes sense to us, but when it shows up on the other end, uh, the customer isn't always clear on which is chicken and which isn't, right? Uh, or which has cheese, which doesn't. So uh, convenience, again, it, it travels through. The, the important thing that we found is if it's on a lid, as soon as it gets there, the lid goes off. So it's really what I would call one-time uh, use item. So, right. Uh, but, you know, even if you use a marker, but boy, when you, when you get six showing up in a bag. And, and on a related note, uh, when you do get feedback, someone calls in, it, it could be as simple as I don't know which one of these is chicken. Mm -hmm. It can be far more complex or it can be a quality yeah. issue. Uh, is that feedback coming via email, phone in real time, through the third-party delivery service? How are you gathering it and what are kind of the, the correct operational procedures for the for the managers? Yeah, you, you know, that's that's an interesting question is uh, with a few of our services, uh, the people are ordering through the app so they have access to the contact us type thing. Uh, we also have via our website um, uh, drop down questions of which one is CEO at Asian Box and that goes directly to me. Uh, so, so we get these directly and we respond to them. Uh, but we want to know. Right. You know, I, I, I kind of like it when some people complain because that tells us they care and it also gives us something we need to know. Right. So I, I openly, I, I'm open to those. Right. And I also know that we don't live in a perfect world on the operating side. Anything can happen. So that's, that's exactly yeah. right. Well, good. We've uh, we've run out of time, uh, and so uh, if there are further questions, there is there is uh, our web address and an email address on the screen. Please direct them to us. We will get them to to Mike if they're relevant for him. Uh, and and I want to just spend the last minute here uh, saying thanks to you, Mike. Yeah, uh, this is great. Every time we get to talk about these things, it's uh, it's insightful for the folks that are listening in, and I think it's a lot of fun for us. Yeah, for uh, sure. So thanks thanks very much and. We're excited to see the growth that Asian Box is doing across the country. Thank you, Zach. It's nice to be here. Awesome. Well, everyone, thank you for joining. I hope you have a wonderful day as we gear up for the holidays, uh, and hopefully this was a good use of your time.